friendship, the heart of theohumanism. In this lecture, we consider friendship. The concept stands at the core of the theohumanistic enterprise. What is friendship? Great minds as far back as Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics have written about friendship. Friends help us to be better people. When we're with them, we don't feel the need to posture or pretend we can be our true selves. And there is wide agreement on the link between friendship and virtue. It is in the very character of a virtuous person to be a friend and to cultivate friendship. And friendship isn't friendship if two friends don't act benevolently towards each other. But there's more to friendship than virtue, however important that might be. For example, with friends, we don't feel the passage of time. Recall that dinner in the company of friends. It went on for hours and yet was unbounded by time. So what is friendship if it can suspend time? And does friendship have anything to do with God? For Aristotle, there could be no friendship with the gods. Humans could imitate the gods in a limited sense, but he saw humans and deities as qualitatively incompatible, making friendship impossible. But for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, Abraham is the model of friendship with God. Is Abraham's friendship with God direct and unmediated, what we mean by friendship in a theohumanistic sense? Not quite. Again, think of your own experience. Friendship is simply friendship. It's not about God, at least not in any obvious way. But it is freeing. It is a source of delight. We feel at peace after being with friends. In other words, friendship has a certain transcendence of its own, even without reference to God. And for this reason, it can easily dispose us to a sense of being in God's presence. Still, when speaking of friendship in a theohumanistic sense, we are speaking of a universal experience that is human to the core, but that also has spiritual implications. Here in this lecture, we look at the concept of friendship through the lens of three figures, Elred of Rivaux, Abu Sa'id ibn Abi al Khair, and Rabbi Aaron Roth. Who were these figures? Elred of Rivaux was a monk of the 12th century, abbot of the Cistercian Monastery of Rivaux in Lincolnshire, England. He wrote biographies of kings and saints as well as spiritual treatises, including one on friendship. Abu Sa'id ibn Abi al Khair, whom we'll refer to simply as Abu Sa'id, was a saintly figure of the 11th century from the city of Nishapur in what is today northeastern Iran. He had a rather controversial teaching style, but would play a pivotal role in making spiritual communities a basic feature of Muslim society. Finally, Rabbi Aaron Roth was born in 1894 in today's Ukraine and became a recognized figure within the world of Hasidism, a powerful spiritual movement that emerged in Eastern European Judaism of the 18th century. Roth would establish a synagogue in the Mea Shearim neighborhood of Jerusalem, where he lived until his death in 1947. We will consider his views as presented by Lawrence Fine of Mount Holyoke College. Friendship is a unique relation that can be defined as a union of two souls. Aristotle spoke of a friend as another you, someone you love as you love yourself. Friendship is different from other kinds of human interaction. Friendship is not networking, it's not a hookup, it's not a business partnership or a partnership in crime. It's not a political alliance and it's not marriage. In friendship there is no goal other than the friendship itself. There is nothing tangible to be gained from the relation and yet we are powerfully drawn to it. Other relations exist for a purpose and end once the purpose is achieved. A business partner, if not also a friend, is dispensed with once the business ends. But friendship, if true, has no purpose other than itself. Some have suggested that we are attracted to friends because of a likeness of souls. Friendship occurs when two souls incline towards one another. We take joy in being with our friends simply for who they are, because of their souls. Friendship thus endures whether or not it serves any external purpose. For this reason, since friendship lasts, whether or not it brings us material gain or physical pleasure, it is possible to speak of friendship as something eternal. It endures by its very nature. Friendship can end, but when it does, we find ourselves asking, was it really friendship in the first place? Did the relation involve two souls that were drawn to each other? Or was it simply about hanging out because we wanted something to do and someone to do it with? Not friendship that endures, but mere distraction. Another important aspect of friendship is the experience itself. How exactly does friendship take place? Do we experience it in terms of sexual pleasure or personal gain? You might be friends with your spouse or your business partner, but you might not be. Friendship might bring benefits, but it is not in terms of benefits that friendship is defined. Friendship, by definition, does not involve the production of offspring or wealth. Friendship is about the attraction of souls. But how is that experienced? How do you experience friendship? Are friends to dress the same, speak the same? Are they to cut up and mingle their body parts so as to look the same? If friendship is a union of souls, how is that union to be physically represented? In one sense, friendship is never disembodied. Friends embrace. They hug and even kiss, depending on society's norms. 
But friendship is not simply physical. It is at the level of the soul that friendship is experienced. Ironically, the possibility of friendship is wholly dependent on the existence of the soul, however one might define it. No soul, no friendship. Friendship as a category of the human experience requires some sense of having a soul. In other words, friendship has a subjective side. It speaks to the soul. It is experienced in the way our soul is drawn to another soul. But is friendship wholly subjective? After all, another soul is necessarily involved in the process. It's not just about our own experience of being attracted to another. Friendship is not just about oneself. It is not a figment of one's imagination or the product of neural emissions in the brain. It only works if it includes something that lies beyond our own cognition, namely another person with whom we seek to share our soul. So friendship demands awareness of how our soul inclines to others or does not. Without this awareness, our relation with others will be measured solely in terms of externals. Do we like their looks? Can we gain something tangible from being with them? Still, while a matter of the soul and thus subjective, friendship draws us into a reality beyond ourselves. Friendship has many sides to it. Is it something only the good can know? Or can you be a wicked person and also be a friend? There's a saying that if you want to know a person's character, look at his friends. In other words, it is a person's friends who shape his character. If they're good, he'll be good, and if they're bad, he'll be bad. This would imply that the bad become friends just as the good do. The bad with the bad, and the good with the good. But friendship is not random. It requires certain qualities of character. Can a person who is fickle, at the beck and call of his latest whim, be a true friend? Can a disloyal person be a friend? Can a person driven by ambitions, set on achieving his own personal agenda, be a friend? Or does friendship require nobility of character? even a willingness to put one's friends before oneself. Again, friendship has many sides to it. Here we focus on a single question. What is the reality into which friendship draws us? Friendship is not something specific to a culture or nation or religion. All peoples know it. It is wholly human, and yet it draws us into a reality beyond ourselves that cannot be reduced to physical metrics such as bodily pleasure or material gain. In this sense, we can think of friendship as something that opens us up to transcendent communion. In that sense, friendship can be a preparation for communion with God. The irony, of course, is that a fellow human mediates the process. Friendship is a human affair, and it can serve as entry point into life with God. Let's begin with Elred of Revaux. His work on friendship, written sometime after the year 1160, is cast as a series of conversations he had with fellow monks. His thoughts on friendship draw upon biblical material, such as the story of the friendship between King David and Jonathan, the son of Saul, as narrated in the books of Samuel. And he also draws upon the writings of church fathers, such as Augustine of Hippo and Ambrose of Milan, as well as the insights of his older contemporary and fellow Cistercian, Bernard of Clairvaux, whom Elred would have known personally but he grounds his reflections on friendship above all in a definition given by a pre-Christian author, Cicero, who in his famous work on friendship speaks of it as agreement in things human and divine with goodwill and charity. Agreement in things human and divine with goodwill and charity. Elred, a Christian monk, builds on the definition of friendship offered by his pagan forebear. What Cicero speaks of as goodwill and charity, Elred conceives of as a relation of love that does not involve vice or sin. Elred thus gives a Christian spin to Cicero's conception of friendship, but one need not be a Christian to know friendship. For Elred, friendship occurs naturally out of a feeling of love for another rather than hope for gain. Indeed, he sees friendship as prior to religious beliefs. All creatures associate, animals and angels no less than humans. Even rocks are found in mutual company. And yet he also speaks of Christ as the beginning and end of friendship. What does this mean? Friendship as rooted in human nature and thus universal, but also particularly Christian. For Elred, friendship is about love, to love and be loved by another. It is thus not a general idea, but a concrete experience. It is about loving and being loved by someone in particular. It therefore differs from charity, which is something Christians owe to all people, even to enemies. In contrast, friendship is limited. It may be the way we grow in goodness, but we can't be friends with everyone. In this, Alred offers a challenge to the idea that monks should not have particular friendships within the monastery. Particular friendships between monks were often frowned upon. Two monks more in love with each other than with the rest of their fellow monks? Such a situation, it was feared, would sow division within the monastic community and detract from the demand to live in charity towards all. 
Alred saw no conflict. Indeed, he saw friendship as a forum in which the spiritual senses were exercised and so awakened to life in God. Just as we have physical senses, which are stronger or weaker from one person to another, so too we have spiritual senses, the purpose of which is comprehension of God. And it is through friendship that our spiritual senses are strengthened and refined. In sum, friendship works to sharpen the senses, the spiritual senses by which we are able to know God, and not only know of God. The mind, after all, can know of God, but can't quite know God as friend. That's the task of the spiritual senses. This is not to define friendship in terms of a purpose other than itself. The idea that friendship sharpens the senses by which we know God is only to say that the human experience known as friendship is spiritual by its very nature. As Aylred puts it, if you remain in friendship, you remain in God. Here, life in God is not about transcending human affections. Our natural attractions are not judged to be a hindrance to life in God, but rather the very expression of it. Of course, friendship does not occur willy-nilly. Elred offers a very clear criteria for testing a friendship to ascertain if it is true. He follows Cicero in stating that true friendship exists only among the good, since a big part of friendship is trust, in trusting one's very self to another, and a person who is not good can't be trusted and so cannot be a friend. After all, you can't be friends with someone you suspect of saying one thing to your face and another behind your back. Friendship, then, must be guided by reason. A friend, if a true friend, cannot demand that we violate our beliefs, that is, the deepest principles we hold, or ask us to harm others. In short, friendship is bounded by virtue. We all know this. We may initially be attracted to a person on account of his or her physical appearance, but if there's not something more, the attraction won't last. In other words, friendship teaches us that what we find most attractive about others is their character, and it is in friendship that we, too, grow in character. This is not to speak of friendship solely as a test of one's character. It is that. It is in the crucible of friendship that our true character is revealed. Are we ready to put our friends before ourselves? or are we ultimately using them for our own agenda? So, friendship does reveal our character, but it's more. It's also medicine for life, consolation in times of trial and confusion, unparalleled delight. Elra takes things even further. At one point in the New Testament, in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to John, Jesus says to his followers that he no longer calls them servants, but friends. Friendship, then, has a special meaning for Christianity. Alred acknowledges the universality of friendship, but also notes its specifically Christian characteristic. The statement by Jesus, calling his followers friends, means that friendship is God's way of proceeding with human beings. In other words, by conceiving of friendship as Christian, Alred is identifying it with Christianity. He's not saying that others don't know friendship, but he is suggesting that it is in friendship that one lives the Christian life. His point is rather remarkable, namely that friendship is the truth that Christianity proposes to the world. In other words, Alred is not just a monk thinking about friendship in light of the classical heritage as represented by Cicero. He is a monk who, in drawing on his own lived experience of monastic life, is saying that friendship is Christianity. To be sure, a lot had occurred in the history of monasticism by Elred's day. The first monks were those who renounced the world, the desert fathers of Egypt and Syria who abandoned city life and its luxuries and temptations. But in the Latin West, monasticism took shape not in the form of isolated hermits in the desert, but as spiritual life and community, as believers who lived in common even if renouncing the things of the world. It wasn't about particular friendships, but rather about a common life that helped individuals grow spiritually, the monastic life as a training ground in charity. And yet there was a sense that the monk should be passionless, as if angelic, since he had removed himself from the world. Alred challenged this idea. For him, the cultivation of friendship with particular persons was vital to the realization of Christian life. Human affections were no impediment to life in God. We see something similar in Lawrence Fine's presentation of the thought of Rabbi Aaron Roth. He notes how Jewish mystics longed to meet one another in order to glimpse the face of the divine presence in their midst. That's quite a statement. According to Rabbi Roth, intimacy with particular persons is a necessary condition for life in the presence of God. In other words, you can't really know what life with God is like if you don't know what it means to be intimate in a very human and particular way. It is worth noting that for Elred, and also for Rabbi Roth, the intimacy in question is same-sex intimacy. The 12th century of Elred witnessed a marked interest in human intimacy both same-sex and other-sex intimacy, as seen in the literature of the period. 
The letters of Abelard and Eloise speak of their immense devotion to one another and to God. The quest for the Holy Grail speaks of heroic virtue and chivalry, but also of deep mutual affection among the Knights of Camelot. Monastic circles, too, became interested in the question of intimacy. The most famous example from the 12th century is the sermons of Bernard of Clairvaux on the Song of Songs. He speaks of friendship with God at times in the erotic imagery of a kiss, the kiss of Christ. Alred also uses this image. He lists three kinds of kisses. First is the physical kiss, the imprint of lips, which has its place in human experience, a husband and wife, for example, or as a seal of reconciliation between enemies. Second is the spiritual kiss, which Elred calls the kiss of Christ. This kiss is not about a physical experience, but rather spiritual communion with Christ, and yet it is offered or mediated through human friendship, pointing again to the close link between human friendship and Christian life in the thought of Elred. There is much to consider here. For example, in Christianity, it is the office of priestly ministry that mediates the presence of God to the world. For Elred, friendship is central to this process. This would imply that to be friend is to be priest. Keep this in mind, the priestly nature of friendship, as you read through the work. To be friend is to be priest. What does that mean for our understanding of priesthood? Finally, Elred mentions a third type of kiss, the intellectual kiss. This kiss involves the infusion of divine grace into the individual soul. It is unmediated contemplation of God. It is direct friendship with God, the kind that Abraham had. It is the kiss of Christ from the mouth of God. But Elred's focus is the spiritual kiss. It is the kiss of Christ through the mouth of another, friendship with God mediated through a holy human friendship. The spiritual kiss of Christ is human friendship that operates on its own terms. It also works to sharpen our sense for life with God. In sum, for Elred, the history of friendship is closely linked to the economy of salvation. It is God's way of drawing all things to life in him. Friendship offers a taste of life in God. But what can be said about the intellectual kiss, which Elred speaks of as unmediated contemplation of God? It seems to have nothing to do with human friendship, since it is more about the direct workings of God's grace on the human soul. But that's not quite the whole story. It is friendship that begins with God at God's initiative, but it has impact on the way we relate with others. In other words, it may begin with God, but it enables true friendship among humans. In a way, it is the reverse process of what Elred calls the spiritual kiss. One of the best illustrations of the workings of the intellectual kiss of Christ is the life of a Muslim figure of the 11th century by the name of Abu Sayyid. Abu Sayyid is remembered as a great friend of God, but this friendship was generative. It worked to bring humans together in true friendship. In other words, his extraordinary friendship with God was so powerful that it engendered a spiritual community, a group of friends in God. The life of Abu Sayyid shows that God bestows a special grace or blessing on certain individuals, thereby commissioning them to bring about his purposes for humanity, namely friendship in God. These figures, spiritual virtuosi, knowers of the intellectual kiss, are so absorbed into the reality of God that, as a report from early Islam puts it, one only has to look at them to be reminded of God. This experience in turn works to bring people together in spiritual community around the chosen friend of God. In other words, those who are friends of God, recipients of a special grace and blessing, in turn act to awaken others, even society as a whole, to the reality of friendship with God. Here it is God who initiates friendship with chosen friends, the saints, and this in turn has a transformative effect upon all who enter into friendship with them. One sees something similar in Judaism. Of course, a key feature of Judaism is the delight rabbis take in the Torah as God's special gift to the community as a whole. In the mystical heritage of Judaism, the Torah is central, but so is the friend. The friend of God can awaken others from their spiritual neglect and can have a transformative impact on their souls. This need not happen in any dramatic way. Rabbi Roth counsels friendship because it is a way for us to come to know what's going on inside us. He advises us to seek out a particular friend with whom we can from time to time talk about God and any troubling thoughts in the soul as if confessing. Such a friend can't be anyone. It has to be someone with experience of friendship with God. Anyone else will have no effect on the heart and will thus be unable to awaken us to the realities of friendship.
Abu Said left no writings, but his great-great-grandson collected reports about his life into a biography that has become a classic of Persian literature. This rendition of the saint's life, this hagiography, is not limited to the facts, but is shaped by the way he was remembered by subsequent generations of those who followed his spiritual path. Abu Said was highly learned in the norms of Islam. He knew the Quran inside and out, but he was also committed to the spiritual life. Not over against, but above and beyond the exoteric regulations, the do's and the don'ts of the religion. For example, he and his disciples would dance together. For him, this was not amusement, but a form of prayer vital for enhancing Sharia prescribed prayers. After all, when it comes to prescribed prayers, one can simply go through the motions. By adding dance, Abu Sa'id brought the motions to life. Again, the point was not to go against the Sharia, but to imbue it with deeper meaning. As well, Abu Sa'id and his disciples were always enjoying one another's company in banquets, feasting upon appetizing comestibles of all kinds, sweet meats, raisins, tasty cakes. What did such gormandizing pleasures have to do with Islam? Indeed, his penchant for feasting made him a controversial figure and earned him the ire of more sober-minded Muslims. How could Islam be about dancing and feasting and enjoying oneself? However, for Abu Sa'id, it was all but a foretaste of life in paradise, which in the Quran, as in the Bible, is described in terms of a banquet. In other words, if you're really a Muslim, you should go beyond the do's and the don'ts and get a taste of paradise here and now. Isn't that the goal, after all? How did Abu Sa'id become such a talented, even if scandalous, teacher of the spiritual life? How did he come to attract so many disciples and friendship as a way to life with God? As always, there's a back story. In his youth, Abu Sa'id had pursued a highly ascetic lifestyle, undertaking lengthy fasting, endless nightly prayer vigils, living in isolation from society, obsessively disciplining his body, and modeling his actions very exactly on those of the Prophet Muhammad. However, things changed when he came to the realization that the mode of driving his pious endeavors was self-conceit. He saw that he undertook his devotions because he enjoyed the holy reputation it won for him in the eyes of the people. Indeed, he concluded from this experience that his religious actions were in themselves a cause of his self-pride, and thus, quite ironically, a source of alienation from God, when undertaken under the illusion that he was the one doing them rather than God through him. Abu Sa'id continued to undertake religious actions as prescribed in Islam, but he realized that he was not the one doing them. Thinking that he was only led to pride and self-centeredness. Rather, all he did, he did by God's grace. In other words, taking things to their logical conclusion, he saw that there was nothing separating him from God. It was here that he entered into what Aylred terms the intellectual kiss of Christ, unmediated friendship with God. At this point, Abu Sa'id realized that it was not rules and regulations that stood at the heart of religion. Those were not to be abandoned, but alone they were not enough. In short, in echo of Thomas Aquinas, he came to understand that religion at its core is friendship with God. But for him, in contrast to Elrid, his friendship with God, the kiss of Christ, came not through the mouth of another, but was initiated through a special grace from God that led Abu Sa'id to realize that he had no ego of his own, no self, since all that he did, he did by the grace of God acting through him. All of this liberated him from the ways of the world and the expectations of society and even the expectations of fellow Muslims. As a result, he abandoned his ascetical practices and began to celebrate, to dance and feast as if in paradise. The freedom Abu Sa'id experienced was not freedom from the world. He had achieved that through his ascetical practices, whereby he cut off all attachments to the world. Now, the freedom he experienced was freedom from his very self. With the self gone, the ego no more, he and God could now be as one, friends, not two, but one. This realization transformed his life, because he ceased to be attached to his own self, and thus to his standing in the eyes of others, he viewed religion in a different light. It had its norms, it had its teachings, but there was no need for him to try to control himself by disciplining his body with his rigorous devotions in order to win a reputation in the eyes of others. He now lived Islam not as a burdensome set of duties and ascetical practices for controlling the body, but as a banquet to celebrate. However, this freedom from the self and the anxieties he had about his own worth and standing before God was not a freedom to do whatever he pleased. 
Every freedom from something is also a freedom for something. Abu Sa'id did not see this existential freedom, God's gift to him, as freedom to be a libertine, although some of the religious and political authorities of the day judged him as such. Rather, he saw his freedom as a freedom to labor on behalf of others, to teach and guide others, and thus help them experience the deep freedom he had known as friend of God. It was through friendship with this saintly figure that others were to be introduced into intimacy with God and thereby to know the joy of true friendship in common. Elrid of Revaux, Abu Sa'id, Rabbi Roth Friendship as a quintessentially theo-humanistic venture it's not all roses. They sometimes chide their followers. After all, the goal is the reduction of pride, a necessary precondition for true friendship. But here is the point. To see a friend brings a blessing. Who would deny that? And friendship is about the body. It's about nods, gestures, glances. It's about embraces. It's about shared emotions, joys and sorrows. But it's also about being united across distance and time. Who would deny that? It works even through our imperfections. To put that in theological terms, friendship is possible even after the fall. It is about the movement of two souls towards each other, melting together as if one. It helps us be freer, nobler, more generous and loving. It helps us see the world in a whole new light, not as arena for networking and empire building, but as arena of transcendent communion, arena of joy and delight, of banquets beyond time and errands. Friendship is both human and divine. It stands at the heart of theo-humanist life.